Last night was such an amazing night. By popular demand, we decided to repeat it tonight. That's right, a lot of the people that watched last night's show where I broke down day one of the DNC convention, they were so happy with my results, so happy with my presentation, they decided unanimously to make me suffer through day two. Well, tonight was supposed to be the biggest night. In fact, it's the most important night of the entire convention because tonight, Joe Biden became your Democratic nominee, officially. Yeah, up till the night, he wasn't the nominee. He was just the guy. People were like, is that the guy? All right. Okay, well, you sure that's the guy? Okay. I got to kiss his butt, right? Because I don't want to be doing no extra butt kissing. Let me just kiss his ass now. But I don't want to kiss it if he don't turn out to be the guy. And this was also the night all of the QAnon people and the former uh, Bernie supporters who lost their minds and went full Trump or something weird, I don't know, deep state investigators, all of them. This is the night they all wanted to stab themselves because this is the night Hillary Clinton was supposed to come out and take the nominee from Joe Biden. Ah, you thought I forgot about all that crap you guys were talking for the last six months. Banana Peel 1776, all in my mentions for the last couple of months telling me, Tim Black, you a stupid person. Anybody can see Hillary going to be the nominee. Well, officially tonight would have been the night she's supposed to come out and do that. Tonight's supposed to be the night that the Democratic Party threw a Hail Mary. Hillary Clinton makes the deep post route. Turns around, ball right there, bam! Right in the numbers, baby. Touchdown! End zone dance, all that. But it did not happen. No, tonight, Joe Biden became your nominee. Yeah, I know. Nothing to be happy about. I'm just saying. I just want to rub it in that you were wrong. I've been wrong about stuff. Accept it. Walk it off. Take the L, as Michael Brooks would say. Sometimes you got to take the L. (laughs) My brother. So, so, here we go. Here we go. So tonight's night, it started off interesting. (laughs) Interesting to say the least. Uh, How did it start off? Oh, yeah, it started off with... uh... Hi. Go. Hi, this is Senator Chuck Schumer, Democratic leader from my hometown, Brooklyn, New York. Behind me is a sight I see out of my window every night, the Statue of Liberty, the same sight that greeted hopeful immigrants like my grandparents, a symbol of freedom and a beacon of hope to the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. It started off with Chuck Schumer proving himself to be an empty suit, but not just an empty suit, an empty suit covering over an empty an empty body, covering an empty soul. That's a lot of emptiness in one person, man. Yeah, six feet of total emptiness. Darkness on the inside. Shout out to Charlie Murphy. Yeah, listen to Chuck Schumer talk. It's like listening to the color beige if it were a person. Listening to Chuck Schumer talk is like, I don't know. No, when George Clooney got thrown into space and and he saved a Sandra Bullock or whatever because he's such a great guy and he floated and he floated into nothingness. That's Chuck Schumer. That's listening to Chuck Schumer. Floating into nothingness. The great void. There were other low points that started it off, but that kind of set the tone. Evening. I'm Julie Chavez Rodriguez, and alongside my friend, Dennis McDonough, I was honored to co-chair this year's Democratic Platform Committee. This spring, the process for drafting our 2020 Democratic Platform began with the formation of the Unity Task Forces. Appointed by Vice President Biden and Senator Sanders, the task forces focused their work on six major policy priorities. Continuing the work of the task forces, the Platform Drafting Committee engaged voters and encouraged them to share their stories so that their values were reflected. The Platform Drafting Committee, chaired by Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, engaged so many throughout our party to ensure that that feedback was incorporated, whether it was received online or through allied groups. But it's, ultimate, it's ultimately dictated by our donors. 
who decide exactly what the hell we're going to try to do and how we're going to screw you over for the next four years. Eight if we're lucky. Yeah, look, man, this platform, no matter what they say in it, it's not a binding contract of any sort. We learned in 2016 that the DNC don't owe you anything. Hell, they owe you less than nothing. Hey, it's a private organization. If they want to go into a back room, shoot dice, throw darts at a board, cockfight with roosters, they can do whatever they want to do because it's theirs. You don't matter. What you think doesn't matter, what you want doesn't matter. Hell, they'll let you send in questions or comments. Doesn't, read, doesn't mean they read them shits. Yeah, they could have wiped their butt literally with your suggestions. At this point, they already have your money. They have your heart. What you going to do? Go vote for Trump? <laughs> yeah, it's not something to brag about as a Bernie supporter that Bernie Sanders had anything to do with this at all. And yeah, I know it's corporate a rock and a hard place. It's like, yo, if I don't try to give input, you'll blame me. And if I do give input and they end up not inputting what I input, then you'll blame me as well. Yeah, that's pretty much how it works, Bernie. You know the you know the drill. You're the fall guy. That's right. Oh, and it's not missed on me that Keisha Lance Bottom has something to do with this garbage as well. Hey, Killer Mike, what's up with your girl, Joe? So it continued. One failed speech after the other, but there were high points. This nation belongs to all of us. And in every election, we choose how we will create a more perfect union, not by taking sides, but by taking stock of where we are and what we need. That's right. High point of the night in the beginning was Stacey Abrams vacuously looking into the camera and talking as if what she's saying was worth listening to. Yes, we are gathered together. Dearly beloved, we are gathered today to recite Prince lyrics. It would have been better to recite Prince lyrics and listen to what Stacey Abrams had to say, but I knew some way she'd wedge in there the whole thing about voting rights or something like that. Something that kind of, because that's really what people are doing. They're increasing their resume. They're trying to stay in the positive, like, mind space of voters so they can, you know, be able to get a position at some point. And every person you see on this stage, well, not stage, every person you virtually see tonight, they're hoping to get a job in the Joe Biden administration. Yeah, I don't have that problem, which is part of the reason why I get to talk as much crap as I do. Because, see, I lost hope a long time ago in the system. Some people would say, poor Tim Black, but I say, hey, it's my superpower, having no hope. Yeah, having no hope means you're not trying out for a job opportunity like Stacey Abrams, where you allowed yourself to be embarrassed on national TV by Joe Biden himself dangling the carrot in front of you going, get it, Suey, get it, Suey, get it, Sue. And then snatching the carrot away and throwing it down the street <laughs> into, a, into a storage drain. A sewage, a sewage drain, yeah, a sewage drain. Oh, uh, yeah, and then having to come out, you know, as a recourse, well, as a consolation, you get to come out and you get to kiss his ring. Nice. Next up was Bill, <laughs> Next up was Bill Clinton. You know, Bill Clinton decided, hey, man, there may be two or three black people I didn't piss off in the last couple of weeks. Give me another shot. A presidential election is the world's most important job interview. At the end, we hire a leader to help us solve problems, create opportunities, and give our kids better tomorrows. That's a tall order this year. With the COVID-19 outbreak on a path to killing 200,000 people and destroying millions of jobs and small businesses. How did Donald Trump respond? At first, he said the virus was under control and would soon disappear. When it didn't, he was on TV every day bragging on what a great job he was doing, while our scientists waited to give us vital information. When he didn't like the expert advice he was given, he ignored it. Only when COVID exploded in even more states did he encourage people to wear masks. By then, many more were dying. When asked about the surge in deaths, he shrugged and said, it is what it is. But did it have to be this way? No. COVID hit us much harder than it had to. 
We have just 4% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's COVID cases. Wow. You heard Bill Clinton with 4% of the world's population and 20% of the world's uh, COVID infection rate. I think that's what he said. It's kind of ironic because we're 5% of the world's population, but 20% of the world's prison population. All thanks to Bill Clinton and Joe Biden. Come on, Bill, take credit for it, man. Own it, man. That's you. You did that. Damn it, man. Got to make these guys own up, man. They're so humble. Not admitting they're the ones who started or enhanced mass incarceration to a level that Ronald Reagan could only dream of. Bubba went on to talk about how Donald Trump doesn't give the Oval Office the respect it deserves. You don't think a president who got caught getting a BJ in the Oval Office should be, I don't know, the person talking about what's acceptable in the Oval Office? Kids, I'm sorry, I can't shelter you from the realities of your government or of the Democratic Party. I refuse to do what your parents have done, which is lie to you. <laughs> lie to you and pretend that there's some dim, some shining light on the hill. Nah, man, that is BS. There's no shining light. That's a, that's a helicopter. It's called a ghetto bird. <laughs> and inside that helicopter are police with guns. And they don't shoot cars. They shoot. Shout out to Richard Pryor. Only the vote blue anywho who shame you on social media are the people that even watch this thing. I know a lot of you didn't watch it. And I respect that and I understand it. In fact, I applaud you. Because if you watched it, you basically gave me no reason for putting myself through the own, my agony of watching it for you. So no reason for both of us to suffer. But there was a shining moment. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bob King spoke, and they reminded me that, or what could have been. I'm Bob King. As a proud union member and former president of a great American union, the UAW, I am honored to nominate Bernie Sanders for president. For decades, Bernie has led the fight for working families fighting for workers' rights to organize unions and collectively bargain. In a time of enormous inequality, he understands that we must confront large corporations which have far too much control over our economy and our politics. Bernie believes health care is a human right and should not be contingent on a job. He knows we can rebuild our crumbling infrastructure by creating millions of good-paying union jobs while combating climate change. Bernie's moral clarity has emboldened the Democratic Party's fight for justice. The grassroots energy of his supporters has cemented important advances in our platform. Bernie will continue to leave a movement that helps defeat Trump and delivers transformational change. I'm excited to place in the nomination the name of a great champion of the working class, Senator Bernie Sanders. Good evening, bienvenidos, and thank you to everyone here today endeavoring towards a better, more just future for our country and our world. In fidelity and gratitude to a mass people's movement working to establish 21st century social, economic, and human rights, including guaranteed health care, higher education, living wages, and labor rights for all people in the United States a movement striving to recognize and repair the wounds of racial injustice, colonization, misogyny, and homophobia, and to propose and build reimagined systems of immigration and foreign policy that turn away from the violence and xenophobia of our past. A movement that realizes the unsustainable brutality of an economy that rewards explosive inequalities of wealth for the few at the expense of long-term stability for the many, and who organized a historic grassroots campaign to reclaim our democracy. In a time when millions of people in the United States are looking for deep systemic solutions to our crises of mass evictions, unemployment, and lack of health care, in el espíritu del pueblo and out of a love for all people, I hereby second the nomination 
of Senator Bernard Sanders of Vermont for President of the United States of America. <sighs> painful, painful, painful. It wasn't enough. We didn't get it done. Now we have to suffer through Joe Biden being the nominee for the Democratic Party. I'm still not so certain that Joe Biden can win this thing. As I listen to Bob King rattle off inspirational tidbits about what we put together about a movement, the only part I had a problem with is he said we had a movement that is going to defeat Trump, and I'm not so sure uh, that's going to happen. And I'm also damn sure that's not why we put the movement together. I love Bob, though. Bob is inspiring. I like his style. He seems to be sincere. He's just wrong. He's wrong if he thinks we put that movement together to propel a Joe Biden to a presidency. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did a good job as well. But in fact, she caught a little little flack for it because some people said, "Hey, man, she should have she should have not appeared. She should have just she should have she should have done." Yeah, okay, okay. We're never gonna be happy. Never be happy with the people that fight for us because they never go as far as we would go. Only thing is we never know how far we would go because we're not the ones that have to go. Well, that was an upbeat moment. If you consider it, you know, th all things considered, this was the best moment of the night. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bob King talking about Bernie Sanders. And then it was a slow, long, painful, arduous trek from state to state to state, to hear how all of them, all of them, I, and, and forgive me, I can't remember if any, did did Bernie carry any state? Did he carry Vermont? He probably carried Vermont. Um, let me just, let me just hammer my state, Maryland. One vote for Bernie, 62 votes for Joe Biden. That's what it all came down to. All the people in Maryland who came out and voted, all of us who mailed in our ballots, all of us who cast our votes, it all comes down to a representative democracy. And you never really know. And that's the problem, you never really know. Because we don't have a real way, a real way of track, tracking votes. We don't have a real way of going back and analyzing the tape. I mean, hey, even football games have instant replay. But no, not our electoral system. We just go, whatever you said, good enough for me. Well, we'll see. And after this, I was tempted to cut off the TV, but I had to keep it going, guys, because I had to see what other catastrophes so I could bring them to you. And this is where it got really hard and difficult. It made me want to go grab a fifth of gin. They started talking about uh, how great Biden was going to be. This is when it really kicked the Biden time into overdrive because, well, all the delegates have been accounted for and Joe Biden was now the officially the nominee. And to kind of kick that off, they started with a feel-good story. A feel-good story to show you what the Democratic Party and what the Joe Biden leg of the Democratic Party thinks about black folks and how, how they know we scrutinize our votes, how we keep our emotions tucked deep inside, and we think very pointedly and seriously about who we want to make the nominee of the Democratic Party, who we want to be the president of the United States. How just because Joe Biden said stupid things like only Latinos are diverse in their thinking about politics, he couldn't be further from the truth because we painstakingly go over our decisions. And that's when they showed this clip to prove it. I take powerful people up on my elevator all the time. When they get off, they go to their important meetings. Me, I just head back to the lobby. But in the short time I spent with Joe Biden, I could tell he really saw me, that he actually cared, that my life meant something to him. And I knew, even when he went into his important meeting, he'd take my story in there with him. That's because Joe Biden has room in his heart for more than just himself. We've been through a lot, and we have tough days ahead. But nominating someone like that to be in the White House is a good place to start. That's why I nominate my friend, Joe Biden, as the next president of the United States. Yeah. Those discerning black folks, man, who, you know, sit down at the table, lay the bills out, 
look each other in the eye, make an informed decision about who they want to ride with to be president of the United States. It all comes down to, he took a selfie with me in the elevator, so you know, hey, he's a good guy. Yeah, what's next? We got the elevator lady, you know, you know, he took a selfie with us, so that means he'll be a good president. What's next? The shoe shine? You know, the shoe shine guy? Hey, I shined Joe Biden's shoes. He didn't quite spit on me. He spit near me, but he didn't land on me. So, hey, I knew then when he turned his face and spit that way, not into the wind that it would blow back on me, I knew right then that Joe Biden could be the best president. Hey, I bag groceries at the AMP. When Joe Biden comes in, he uh, looks me in the eye and says, next time don't throw a ham on top of my bread, mofo. Yeah, he doesn't say it loud to embarrass me in front of everybody, but he lets me know that I can't stack for shit. And that's how I know that Joe Biden Oh, yeah, Joe Biden. That's my guy. And that's the type of man we need to lead us, to lead this country. A guy who won't embarrass you in front of everybody. Now, I wasn't offended at all that Joe Biden, that the, the team decided that this was the way that they want to represent black people, working black people, uh, making a decision about him. Nothing to do with policy. Nothing to do with a single, solid, single solitary thing that he plans to do for that lady's kids or her cousins or nephews or neighbors or friends or her co-workers. Nothing. She don't give a shit about anything else. You know, when I, when I see people like Candace Owens and people of her ilk, and I hate to mention her, but I got to say it, when I, when I see these conservatives or, or fake conservatives, because some of them are just looking for a check, and I get it, it's tough out here. Mama need a new pair of shoes. Baby need a babysitter. People gotta make money. And as disgusted as I am with them, I always have a spot in me that says, you know what? I blame them, but I also have to keep in mind that the Democratic Party is full of it. It's full of it, it plays identity so often, and not substance. So what do people owe this party? What do I owe this party? Nothing. I don't owe it a damn thing, Johnson, because at the end of the day, they use my blackness against me to get votes. And then when I say give me something for the black vote, they say I'm being divisive. Then they send out their hordes of black inside people who are adjacent to the table to, you know, chastise me on Twitter, <laughs> to call me names like Trump supporter though I've never voted Republican in my life, all because I say give the black vote. If you want the black vote, earn the black vote. Do something for the black vote. And I'm not a celebrity who just came out, who comes out at general election time when there are no other people running, and now all of a sudden I get revolutionary. No, I've been talking this since day one, man, since the word go. So... It's just disappointing. I'm not saying I support any of these people who are def defecting to the Republican Party because, hey, this is the home of both parties suck, Johnson. I clearly understand both parties suck. There is nowhere to run to. The only place to run is to run the government ourselves. And to do that, it's going to take another party, and I get it. Until then, we fight the good fight. Anyway. Well, it was said that the people that put together this unconventional DNC convention, it was said that they uh, they had expertise, they knew what they were doing, and they proved it. They proved it at the closing of the show where they had a nice, glossy, great, uh, touching, compelling Jill Biden telling the story of her and Joe Biden. My brother said, there's this woman, you'll really like her, Joe. So I gave her a call, and she had a date that night. You said, um, do you think you could break your date? Oh, that's right. And, w w and, and what'd you do? <laughs> well, I called and uh, told the guy that I had a friend in from out of town and went out with Joe. I was 30 and I was a senator and I was a widower. Several years earlier, 
a tractor trailer and broadside my wife and three children. My wife was killed and my daughter was killed. I, I wasn't big on the, the whole date scene thing. But when I met Jill, I fell in love with her when I saw her. I'd really like to see you again. So he, he's looking at his calendar and he's, oh, Thursday, no, 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 I'm really busy. No, I'm busy Friday. How about tomorrow? <laughs> and I thought, buddy, you just blew your cover. They're a very close family. She's the eldest of five girls. She's kind of like the godmother <laughs> of all of us. The honor of serving as your first lady, I will too. And with Joe as president, these classrooms will ring out with laughter and possibility once again. The burdens we carry are heavy, and we need someone with strong shoulders. I know that if we entrust this nation to Joe, he will do for your family what he did for ours. Bring us together and make us whole. Carry us forward in our time of need. Keep the promise of America for all of us. Well, great job. <laughs> oh, I love it. How are you? <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Jill Biden's husband. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Jill Biden's husband. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Jill Biden's husband. <laughs> That's right, everyone, that was Joe Biden's husband. You know, at this point, I don't even know what's real, what's not real anymore. You know, you listen to Joe Biden, and he says things that make no sense. The words just trail off into the nothingness. You wonder, is it anyone home? Is that house empty? Does the ring alarm even work in the front? Man, that's the nominee that the Democratic Party wanted, so that's guess that's who they decided to get. I mean, like they stated, it's their party. All right, guys, tomorrow I'll be covering day three. It's my obligation to sit through as much of it as possible. I uh, hope that you'll join me for it.